Hi, I'm Pascal. And I'm Jala. And that's Shruti over there, who'll be joining us shortly. Um, so yeah, um, I doubt I'm hands up if you've read or looked up any classified materials that have leaked over the last <laughs> six months. I'm wearing one. Plus. <laughs> Arguably, potentially, yes. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so, yeah. Um, I think many of us have toyed with this idea of to what extent technology can be used to track and surveil, um, monitor, look after, gain information about people, groups of people, individuals, citizens, whatever. Um, and it's an idea that I've sort of been thinking about more and more, thanks to what's been happening over the last year, and thanks to the terrible SharePoint practices at NSA um, <laughs> that allow someone to write a simple script and just scrape everything. Um, but aside from that, I don't really want to get sort of, I know we can go there, I, I, I ultimately would like this to sort of be a discussion. So um, I don't know, the th I would like to just broach a couple of themes and ideas that I've been toiling around and that I've discussed with um, Jala and Shruti on and off, um, and I guess maybe in one way we could phrase this theme or start as a, consider it as a departure point, is this sort of this statement, maybe I shouldn't Google this or shouldn't Google that. Because uh, we don't know who might be watching. Watching or, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so how about we start off with talking about a little bit about what Panopticon is, because I don't know how many people who mm. here are familiar with the concept of the Panopticon. I know what it is, um, I just googled it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. It's for all the locations in GTA San Andreas, I think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the Panopticon was an idea that, just a quick primer in case, you know, um, that Jeremy Bentham came up with in what, the 1900s? Was it? Yeah. 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 Um, and it's basically a design of a prison where the guard tower is in the middle and all the cells are sort of around the outside and the inmates can't see one another, but they can see the guard tower, which has one-way glass, so you don't know whether there's actually someone in there watching what you're doing or not. Um, and this was expanded upon by Foucault in well, mid 20th century, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who was particularly interested in how this makes people self-monitor and sort of police themselves. So power doesn't have to be exercised directly because you have people exercising that sort of censorship and power exactly. over themselves because they're not sure whether or not they're being watched, they're not sure. So um, you create the structure that houses that surveillance and you allow, or you create well, it doesn't those necessarily house the surveillance, it's no. the impression of Well, yes. no, you, you create the structure that allows the people, well, that gives the impression, or creates the conditions under which people will surveil themselves as though they were an external watcher, so you don't actually have to put in the effort to surveil them, you just create the structure yeah. that makes mm. that happen. Mm. Yeah. And so the idea of Panopticon 3... Yeah, so um, I guess the, the sort of question that I'm getting at is this original building design I think is quite intriguing um, and it was explicitly designed for the reasons that were outlined below. Bentham has written about this at length and other people have explored upon this. It's interesting to note Bentham is a utilitarian philosopher and uh, this was particularly to meet these conditions in this line of thinking. What I'd like to... I, I don't... I, I'd like to just throw this out there as a sort of a topic and an idea and explore this as a theme. What this as a technology in terms of a building um, has in common with that. Does anyone know what that is? That's a fiber. Yeah, it's a fiber optic splitter. So, sitting on a big telecommunication 
So that's the, the uh, schematic drawing of it. This was actually the schematic drawing that was supplied by David Klein in 2006, who was a NSA employee who worked in room 16A something or other, uh, which housed at AT&T, which is a little secret room on the uh, uh, west coast of the United States. And he came forth and this was admitted into the court documents as the schematic design for the fiber optic splitter that would literally cut in half the fiber optic line as it entered and left the west coast of the United States, providing, ostensibly, the NSA, a full copy of everything that ran over this fiber. So, yeah, I, I, I guess the departure point of thinking that, that I'd like to go from is what, if any, similarities are there between the technology that we saw in that first building and something like this. And this is only one, those of you who are familiar with the technologies and the specifics that are coming out, um, this is just one of many forms, um, I guess, technologies of surveillance. Um, but yeah, well, I, I guess that's... I mean, the interesting thing, I, I've always assumed that this was going on, which is where there's the panel developed the Opticon. Um, I'm, 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 I've always felt that I was broadcasting data, you know, I'm leaving digital footprints everywhere. Yeah. Somebody's got to be taking you out. This is more, this is actually proof that it's going on. And it's taking it to a very, like, we know we're being surveilled now. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it was the assumptions that we're being surveilled, or we believe we were. Yep. But this kind of surveillance was always supposed to be secret, versus the Panopticon, where you knew you were being surveilled. The, you said utilitarian philosophy, utility wars mm -hmm. to have that effect of. Mm -hmm. I'm being surveilled, so I won't. I won't do this. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But that brings up the idea: is, is it actually undesirable from the NSA's perspective? That that's a root. Yeah. Precisely, that's it's a really exactly. interesting. Yeah. Mm. Mm. The digital equivalent of the actual panopticon, mm -hmm. and this is one of the obviously one of the things that is always raised in counter in counter to the argument of if you do nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear, mm. because the way we behave, yeah. the way we conduct ourselves in public and private, and the way that we think about things is intimately shaped by a concept of are we under surveillance or not? Mm -hmm. Who's looking? Yep. Um, and you know whether it's a religious concept of an all-seeing and knowing. Um, God, God yes. will either reward or punish you, yep. or whether the government plays that role, it actually intrinsically affects the way we, we behave or can and yep. think and interact and go about our daily business. Yep. Because we may or may not be or we fear that we are under surveillance. Yeah. So this is sort of the idea of panopticism, which is. which. <laughs> Just to introduce those who have, there was a brief flurry of hands of folks who are new to this concept of like, well, the idea of moving from the Panopticon, which was this original design and the, uh, the name that get, uh, Bentham gave this building to Panopticism as a sort of social theory, um, which is primarily, this is sort of summed up, this is Michel, Michel Foucault writing about Panopticon, the Panoptic, uh, Panopticism in Discipline and Punish. This is in 1977. Um, I, if you, I put it up there for those. I don't, I don't really like to read out aloud other it's, people. It's, still, it's a social engineering concept. Pardon? It's really using it as a social engineering concept. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, one, that's certainly one way to view it. Um, that's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the, what I'd like to get at now is the changes, perhaps, that we might see in... Um, I'd, I'd like to just finish off this theme and then I kind of want to bring it out for, for I'd pass it to you guys and then kind of open it up. Um, Panopticon 1 was essentially the Panopticon as, as designed and, and, and suggested by Bentham. Panopticon 2, if we want to kind of make a lineage out of it and as things develop and as these technologies progress, um, could be placed as sort of the, the height of the 20th century government surveillance machine. So. Um, the Stasi in the GDR would probably be the perfect example of this. Um, I think it's very interesting to note that the Stasi also perfected another technique in their surveillance, which was incredibly overt, just like you mentioned before. Um, the term is Zersetzung in German, which means um, to, to, uh, to move or to move around or to displace something. And this practice 
by the Stasi, I thought was quite interesting to this comment that this surveillance is in fact, maybe there is a, a reason why some of it is overt, which is to make it known to the surveilled that they are being surveilled. So Zersetzung um, was very different to covert surveillance. In Zersetzung, the Stasi would actually go to your house, would change alarm clocks, would leave a, a pornography magazine lying on your open on your bed, they would um, change your perfumes, they would mail your partner um, sex toys, they would overtly go into your environment and make it known that someone was there. And there were two general common reactions to this. One was um, the people would stop behaving in a way that they felt that uh, which made them a target of interest. And the second one is they would consider themselves as going nuts, <clears throat> as in their friends did not believe them, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now we get to this third idea, which is the... Oh, sorry, so, yep. one, so for those two examples, one, you, so the covert analysis is really about getting evidence to prosecute or to find out the evidence. So it's nothing, they're using a single advantage. Mm. Whereas this, this other form of mutilation is really to influence their behaviour. So you want them to change their behaviour versus want them to continue it. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, it's that, it's that idea of this, the effects of surveillance are permanent whether or not the act of surveillance is continuous. So you make it a discontinuous act so that once you find out once there is an instance now we know we're being surveilled, we may or may not be surveilled in the future, we may or may not have been surveilled in the past, the act of the effects of that mm. one notion is now continuous and we're all self-monitoring and changing behavior in some way, shape or form, even though the surveillance itself was a conti discontinuous um, event. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, Just um, reading that, it appears that the surveillance was supposed to appear to be continuous. Un under the original concept of the Panopticon, absolutely. That was the explicit idea, yes. Um, and I, I guess now to, to bring it to the third manifestation or the third sort of theory of this. Uh, so the third, the Panopticon 3 is now this weird new idea which is that previously which, that which would have cost a state millions of dollars potentially over a year in order to surveil, follow, track a single person today can be achieved using consumer off the grade electronic hardware and open source technology and you reduce the unit cost or the per person cost potentially to th several thousand dollars at most. Um, what that means for surveillance, so that's surveillance of the few by the many, sort of the reverse, I think is also begs exploring to a certain degree. Um, I think there's a, on the Wikipedia page, there's a, a kind of, pardon? Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah, Panopticon 3, here we go, is affordable, effective, and available to anyone who wants to use it. Initial purchase prices and monthly service fees are equivalent to cell phone costs. In less than five years, the cost of continuous surveillance of, an individu of a single individual has dropped from several hundred thousand dollars per year to less than 500 per year. Surveillance formerly justified solely for national security and high stakes commerce is readily available to track a spouse, a child, a parent, an employee, a neighbor, a stranger, etc. But that kind of service is hardly new. Private investigators. Sure, but I guess this also brings up this idea of um, the dragnet and be the, the technological capacity to efficiently pull in everything. It's about, it's about reducing the barrier to entry. Yeah. Mm. And I think things, things that once upon a time, um, you know, um, various security agencies would have found desirable to be able to do are now actually finally becoming possible. Yeah, I think as technology has increased, the ability to surveil that, that, that activity has, has increased as well. In the past, when there was no internet, you could look at all books a person has, has bought just by going to the bookstore that they went to. Mm. No, I mean, you kind of couldn't. You'd have to go to every bookstore that they had any transaction with. 
and the digital interconnect well, well, the credit card is actually makes them. Well, you can, but it's much budget. more intensive, and it means that you have to select your targets much more carefully, as opposed to what the NSA is doing, which is just siphoning up everything and then looking for patterns, as opposed to well, having a probable yeah. cause to get a warrant and then targeting a specific individual. Then you can bring those. That, that's a legal issue. That, yeah, yeah, but it's also <laughs> a, a time and resource yeah. issue. Yeah. And sorry, I think there was. I think there was just one more comment. Uh, I'd be interested to know then, uh, what was the result of not declaring number one. Did they change? I mean, did, did it change their behaviour? Yes. 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 And, yes. And, uh, or, did, or did they say, "Well, I don't really care. I'm locked up anyway." So the, so the, there are a range of sort of social studies on this, um, ranging from deeply philosophical to um, far more empirical. Um, the common ground is it induced states of passivity and docility in inmates. Um, it, it's in, it in groups as, as well, when those inmates were still together, um, it, the inmates would self-discipline each other in some form. Like, quite, not, not in a... Um, not in an overt form necessarily, but qu quite subtly. Um, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I can talk to the social Yeah, to what extent is there now, is this overlap now becoming a, a major component of our society? And like, this is the idea of this sort of uh, uh, an overarching surveillance state or a surveillance. Uh, not, See, I don't care about the NSA, providing hmm. they don't do anything to me. I mean, I but you will when they do. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mm. I will if, if, if I was assured that they weren't going to come in and, and, and uh, invade Australia or, um, mm. and, and do something to me, then well, I don't care about it. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, the, the idea of shared responsibility when it comes to surveillance and self monitoring isn't new and it isn't distinct to mm. this model of prison. No social behaviour is we self-monitor in a range of ways on a daily basis and that's part of society yeah like what you wear what you do who you talk to what you think yeah. um, which beliefs you adopt which group you're part of which group you're an out um, what's your in-group what's your out-group these are not concepts that are specific to um, surveillance so I think the panopticon was at least to me a an interesting visual representation of a particular kind of surveillance, but is it social the monitoring. Power is, it, is it that you are you don't have the power in that relationship? You believe you're being surveilled by somebody who's got more power than you. I think it certainly is an aspect of it. I think it would be too simple to reduce it to that because, to like, m like most other relationships, also have an element of a power imbalance. I mean, most. I think an equal relationship is a myth. Then, if you, I mean, at the moment, the scale isn't there to, mm. for myself to own all the metadata in the world. Correct. But that might come that mm. day. And that day, if everybody had all the access to all the metadata in the world, would that then close that gap? Can I throw in here, uh, it, it's been mentioned before, but the Transparent Society, which David Brin, an SF author among others, has talked about, um, has made the point that, you know, one way of addressing the power imbalance is if the people surveil those who are surveilling them. Uh, and it's already been mentioned, I think, a number of times, that just the rise of cell phones, and you look at the number of court cases you've seen in the last dozen years where somebody has caught police, I'm picking one of them, you know, the people, you know, beating up a black person. Yeah, that, that's been several cases there of in the US. That's showing how it can change. And it's certainly really interesting to look at the sort of thesis of the transparent society. Um, just the other thought while I'm speaking I was going to throw in. Uh, this thought, it reminded me that uh, the same idea was used in the convict settlements here in Australia. In Port mm. Arthur, the yeah. churches mm. had exactly that same circular yeah. yeah. set up that all of the yeah. inmates were in a little cubicle where they could all see the minister in the middle, but they couldn't see each other. Mm. 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 Yeah. Um, I don't know. One of the other things that I find interesting about this in the context of the sort of Snowden leaks and stuff like that um, is that with the technology that this is being, the sort of surveillance is being carried out with now, I think coming back to your point that would it change if everyone had access to all the metadata, I don't know if 
it really would because I think for most people knowing how to actually get information out of that data is you know that's 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 a barrier. <coughs> it's, it's a barrier to entry. It's the same way. Um, yeah, I mean, the, but still, the traditional power structures will have that. Like, you're only an individual mm. versus a government. Mm. Um, they can use the information for whatever they want still. Mm. And you're just, uh, if they want to prosecute something, they will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like suggesting that just because everyone can access Wikipedia, everyone's now a genius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. I think there are actually grand metaphysical sort of. I mean, the. The data center that the NSA is building in Bluffdale uh, to host perhaps a large majority of the data that is captured in one form or another and then compute it or restore it for retroactive analysis, etc. I think there are differences there already um, between what we might be able to achieve, or even in a decentralized fashion, a group of people around the world might be able to achieve. Um, Additionally, I think there's a fantastic talk. If anyone's interested in this, 30C3, the 30th yes. Chaos Computer Congress. Um, what are the two names? Oh, they're fantastic. Um, oh, um, the tech journalist and um, I've just forgotten their two names. Um, two amazing ladies got up and did a talk uh, called um, why to, How Technology is Essentially Neither Good, Nor Evil, Nor Neutral. Um, and they explored, I, I, I love this talk because they explored quite if, in, a, in a soft way at first but then in a, quite made it apparent that we cannot consider technology to be purely negative or positive either to one party or to another party or in general nor can we consider it to be neutral because um, technology arises always in power relations because it is embedded within the society with which we live. Yeah. Um, and I guess the the point they were getting at was that surveillance is in a certain, in a certain form about care, not care in, in a very ambiguous form in the sense that a state must surveil, must by definition in some form surveil its constituents in order to be, to know them, to know what they need, to provide for them. So I think there are interesting linkages here to even other domains that think this tech community is interested in, for example, open data. Um, so I think that's another theme that bears exploring um, because we commonly hear from folk that, you know, the tech is agnostic or the tech doesn't care, which I think is a, a dangerous way to proceed because it ignores the, um, the ways in which that tech is born. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
where it's going. You don't know who might see it, um, which is what really brings it back into this concept of panopticon in terms of surveillance, not just surveillance in general. And so with all this uncertainty around, you know, who is it that I'm trying to decide whether to trust or not? I, yeah. I would say there's actually a fundamental difference between... Uh, th there's actually a conflict of interest, I would say, fundamentally, between the mandates of certain intelligence agencies, n not just from national perspectives, but fundamentally at heart from a philosophical point, between the trust that we would like to establish with others in a collaborative fashion and the trust that a national security organisation that we might mm. have towards one or not. Yes. There was that they were on the basis that they had trusters. So they got surprised. But they're looking for bad news. Mm. Right? Rather than for protection. That's the argument mm. the the Exactly. There's also the element of surveillance. We're all bad. No, no, we're all potentially bad. Okay, well I think we're just sorry, I think the interesting thing is that that the nature of being disjunct and, and not actually permanently known as being always on is actually almost a worse and more jarring yeah. situation. Yeah. If we all knew that every every skerrick of information that we ever touched was literally being reviewed all the time by somebody... We would behave we right quite differently. We understand what the ground rules mm. are and we understand how to behave mm. in that mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. If we have an expectation that it will never be that good cause by people whom we trust and we access for any, any trivial reason, we also know how to behave. When we think that it's intermittent and we're never sure whether this particular piece of information may or may not be accessed by anybody and for what purpose, that is actually um, you know, like a more traumatic set of... I agree. Mm. The ground rules are yeah, I agree. And, and the issue of trust is one that the actions of the NSA, and obviously we're not just talking about the NSA, we're talking mm. about a whole lot of other agencies in a whole lot of other countries, it fundamentally breaks trust on a whole range of different areas, right? yes. area, mm. on different levels. It breaks trust of citizens and their government. It breaks trust in the ability to actually trust the technology and the underlying network and the protocols, the not Absolutely. The protocols. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so it, it means that we can't make assumptions. Speaking, for instance, on a very practical local level, you know, the ACT government has just announced um, a plan to roll out free public Wi-Fi. Mm. If we don't trust the underlying technology and the government and that it won't be used, yeah. who's going to connect to that? So it means yeah. it's a pointless waste of investment if for no other, you know, no other reason. Yeah. So. yeah. All right. Well, we're out of time. So yeah. there are cupcakes and we can continue talking about oh. it over there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much.